we're really excited um, for this series. I want to do thank the uh, Colorado Health Foundation for support um, in partnership with also PNTC and the Alliance. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah um, to start us out today. And again, um, Sarah, I'd have you and uh, Lucille both introduce yourselves when you please uh, when you present. We will have some time between each presenter for some specific Q and A. So as Aaron mentioned, if you can use the chat. Um, and then at the end of today, for those of you joining just by a phone, we will open up the phone lines. Uh, but we'll have Sarah and Lucille introduce themselves when they are up to present. But Sarah, are you ready to go? And can I turn it over to you? I'm ready. All right, awesome. So thank you so much. And I'm going to go on mute. So thanks, Sarah. Great. Let me um, pull up my slides for everyone. Um, can you see it? Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Um, so as Andy said, my name is Sarah Brummett. I um, work um, normally at the health department um, in the violence and injury prevention mental health promotion branch, specifically our office of suicide prevention. Right now, as you can see, I'm also working from home. Um, so what I really wanted to provide folks with was a very, very quick snippet of some data, but more importantly, where you can find data in case that's helpful um, in supporting your communities. Um, we could spend all day and tomorrow talking about the different types of data that we have. So I really wanted to focus the meat of my time with you all on some of the work that's going on around the state and then how you can get connected to resources, both at the state and local level. So I hope that's what you're looking for because that's what you're getting. Um, I always like to do some level setting at the beginning of you know, any presentation around suicide prevention and really focus on how we talk about the issue matters. And I really like this slide. I took it from um, Now Matters Now, um, which is a great resource um, website that's available for free for folks. Um, but just really thinking about how we talk about things um, has an impact on people on a variety of issues suicide prevention, mental health promotion included. Um, the main takeaways, in case you're all um, living with some Zoom fatigue and need to mentally check out for 20 minutes or so, um, the takeaways I really want you to um, walk away from this is, you know, when we're talking about suicide being preventable, we're really talking about at the community level, how can we create community context um, and lives worth living. Um, and so it's, we're not talking about um, individual heroes out in the community really trying to save everyone. We're talking about how we set up our communities needs to change, our systems need to change to support folks. Um, when we talk about data, um, there's a number of data points that are missing from our traditional data systems. And one of the big important ones is really telling the story of recovery. Millions of, an, of Americans and Coloradans experience thoughts of suicide every year, but millions of people don't die by suicide in our country. And so there's recovery and resilience um, that are happening every day, and that's not always reflected in the data that we typically see in media reports and things like that. Um, but when we're talking about suicide prevention, talking about more than, like I mentioned, that intervention point. That's certainly important, but we also need to focus on some prevention, preventing crises from developing, empowering communities and individuals with um, coping skills and resources. And then we're also talking about postvention, which is kind of the jargoning word for how a community organization or group responds after there's been a crisis or an attempt or a fatality. And all of those are really important. Kind of just setting the stage there. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, some data. And before I, I talk about data, I really like to recognize that you know, our fatality data that we have, um, that we report on from the health department, those are, are real people and real um, tragedies for our communities. And just remembering that you know, in all the graphs and percentages and numbers that can get lost. And so really just recognizing what these reflect for our communities. 
So nationally, um, you can kind of see the scope of the issue of suicide. It really exists on a continuum. So as I mentioned, you know, millions of Americans experience thoughts of suicide, and that looks different um, for different people. That could be something that is chronic that you deal with every day. It could be situational. It could be brought on by um, times of increased stress, loss, things like that. Um, but as you move up kind of the pyramid there, you can see that fewer, um, not everyone who has thoughts of suicide will make an attempt. Not everyone who makes an attempt will die by suicide. And so really thinking about this as a continuum um, and remembering that um, recovery and resilience are, are true norms um, for this issue. But again, that story is not often told in our communities as frequently as the fatalities are. So speaking of fatalities, this past week, um, we got our 2019 suicide death numbers from our Office of Vital Statistics. Um, and so for 2019, we lost 1,287 Coloradans to suicide. Um, and putting that in perspective for some other um, leading causes of death, that's traditionally more than you see by um, breast cancer, influenza, motor vehicle crashes, things like that. It's a leading cause of death um, here in our state, one of the top 10 leading causes of death. Um, there, we do have a, a relatively new data tool that is available um, for anyone on our website. And we're always looking at opportunities to improve that and add additional data in there. Um, but the data tool is really to provide something that's a little bit more interactive so that you could select the community you work in or a specific population that you serve and really look at how the issue of suicide is impacting that community, that population, um, and what some of those circumstances prior to death might have been. And this really helps us um, focus our prevention efforts, um, create priorities, track um, trends in Colorado and things like that. So if data is something that you get jazzed about, I would definitely encourage you to take a look at the, um, the data dashboard. I, I popped in the, the website there. Um, I think this is actually a screenshot of an older version. So now on the website, there's even more um, variables that you can sort through. Um, just a few quick points, um, and then I promise to move on from data, um, just so that everyone has kind of the similar talking points. Here in the Rocky Mountain West, we do tend to have higher rates of suicide, and so this um, kind of paired back graph is just showing that here in Colorado, um, we do have a rate that's higher than our national rate. And there's kind of a similar trend that we've been seeing um, both nationally and here in Colorado of a slight upward trend, but we've been um, really at that 20 per 100,000 for a few years now. Um, I would also kind of highlight the um, disparities that we see in some of in our fatality data, both across the age span and specific to um, sex. And so we do see males are disproportionately rep represented in our fatality data, particularly among the working age group. Um, and we see kind of the opposite in our um, attempt data that we get from emergency departments and hospitals. Um, so we tend to see a younger age group, um, predominantly female, in that um, data set. That's all I'm going to present on data. If, I think the slide deck that um, Karen and Andy will be sending out after, if they haven't before, has a, a few more slides in there and a few more links on where you can go to find additional data. Uh, but really, I wanted to focus on some of our state initiatives. And as I was trying to pack all of the information into these slides, um, it really um, reinforce there's so much going on here in Colorado, which is um, awesome to see. I've been with um, the state office for about six years now, and really from six years ago to now, um, the number of initiatives, the number of partners, the amount of funding that we have dedicated for suicide prevention has 
more than um, quintupled, if that's even a real word, it probably isn't. But we, we've just seen a really rapid increase in the momentum and attention um, given to this topic area, which is great to see. So in our Office of Suicide Prevention, our office was created in 2000 um, via statute. And since then, we've um, received a number of pieces of legislation adding responsibilities to our office. Um, we have a Suicide Prevention Commission, which really serves as our advisory board um, for setting evidence-based data-driven recommendations for Colorado. Um, we have some pieces of legislation creating a school grant program, helping to build connections with our healthcare systems, things like that. Um, we also have a number of initiatives that we've um, grown here in Colorado just based on things that have gone really well um, in other states or other countries. Um, so we've been working with national partners to really build a robust um, strategic approach to suicide prevention that really captures that full continuum of prevention, intervention, and postvention. Um, we have a small community grants program out of our office where we try to support local communities with um, priorities that they've identified. Um, we have a pretty cool project where we're partnering with the Colorado Crisis Line to provide continuing um, caring outreach to folks after they're discharging from emergency departments and inpatient hospitals after um, an attempt or other behavioral health crisis. Since we know that's a high risk time period for folks. Um, and sometimes it's really hard to navigate um, how to get connected with um, the right resource in your community or make that follow-up appointment. And so really removing some barriers and making sure people are supported after that happens. Um, we've also been partnering with the firearm community along shared values to support um, firearm suicide prevention. I'll share a little bit about that. Um, we also have the Man Therapy Initiative um, that we've been a partner on um, since it was created here in Colorado. Um, I think I have a slide a little bit later on that. Um, we've also been leading some work with a number of other Colorado organizations to really support um, and build out the resources uh, to support veterans, service members, and their families. Um, and then there's a number of other duties as assigned. We have a few um, federal grants, which is really amazing, helping to expand the resources available in Colorado. So that's the quick and dirty of things kind of out of our office. Um, I mentioned that we've been working to build kind of a comprehensive approach to suicide prevention. And so this is just a, a visual representation of kind of the broad bucket categories of where the work falls and what we're really trying to prioritize here in Colorado, which is building community connectedness, supporting economic stability, um, improving education and awareness opportunities across the board, not just for um, clinical providers, but also for community members, um, improving care once people manage to get in the door, um, working on lethal means safety initiatives, and then as I mentioned before, suspension. So this is a quick map and it's based on last year's um, annual report. Um, so I can tell you that it's an even bigger footprint um, for what we have this, this current year. And so really it's just looking at um, the different types of initiatives that fall under those bucket areas um, and what's going on funded through our office. So we know that there's a ton more work happening across the state and in communities than what we're able to fund, but this is just kind of a visual representation of where some of those um, efforts are happening along those categories. So I did wanna spend a little bit of our time together talking about lethal means safety, um, since that's one of the things that we've really seen um, as an increasing priority here in Colorado, especially um, due to some of the changes that we've seen since March in our communities. Um, so when we're talking about firearm violence, um, here in Colorado, we have to be including in that um, suicide. So when you're looking at firearm fatalities here in Colorado, um, almost 80% 
of those that we lose to firearms are by suicide. And so if we're not talking about suicide when we're talking about firearm safety, we're missing a huge piece of the conversation. So to further drive home the point, um, if you remember kind of some of my earlier slides had that um, pyramid really showing that not everyone who makes an attempt will go on to die by suicide. What we know is that over 90% of those who have experienced a suicide attempt will not go on to die by suicide. And so what someone uses in a suicide attempt um, can determine whether they have that second chance at recovery or not. And so really what we're talking about when we're talking about lethal mean safety for suicide prevention is just creating time and distance between someone who might be struggling and um, a lethal method. Usually we're talking about firearms, medications, and poison. So just creating some time and distance can help um, create a protective environment where they can move past the crisis that they're facing. So when I'm talking about lethal mean safety, specifically around firearms, typically um, people get really uncomfortable. It's a hot topic in our society um, and it can get people's um, discomfort level up. Um, and so really want to set the stage that we're not talking about a polar engaging in some political debate around firearm ownership. Um, and we're also not asking our firearm community members to become mental health experts and diagnose their friends. Um, we're not talking about um, a complete ban on firearm ownership. We're talking about temporary safety. And firearm safety is already built into the foundation of firearm ownership for 99.9% .9 of firearm owners. And so really we're partnering on that shared value that no matter where you stand on firearm ownership, um, no one wants someone to use a firearm in a suicide attempt. Um, there's also a really cool resource and I included a link to it um, on my slide deck um, but there are a number of locations around Colorado that will offer temporary storage for firearms if, for whatever reason, it might be safer to temporarily take those um, out of the home. Um, and that's really focusing on empowering the firearm owner, empowering families to make those decisions um, and identify what would work best for them. We also have um, uh, video. It's available on our website, um, but it's a really cool resource just running down what some of those elements of firearm safety and firearm suicide prevention are. Um, we partnered with one of our firearm advocates um, here in the metro area, um, Jimmy Graham. He did an awesome job of really presenting um, the information and some of those resources and considerations for firearm owners to make in determining what works best for them and their families in terms of storage options. I mentioned man therapy, so I don't know if anyone has um, ever visited the website or not, um, but if you haven't and need a little bit of a pick, a pick me up at the end of kind of your Zoom fatigue of the day, I would encourage you to take a look. Um, really, this website was created about eight years ago um, based on what we see in our data. Men are overrepresented in our fatality data, not just for suicides, but also for alcohol-related fatalities, um, for substance use indicators. And we know that they're not as likely to reach out and get help through tr traditional avenues. And some of the messaging um, with our traditional mental health um, jargon doesn't land, it doesn't resonate with men. And so the website was designed to really engage and support men with their mental health, um, with tools, with resources, um, regardless of whether they are interested in learning more about um, depression or alcohol use or relationships or whatever the issue might be, um, and just provide a safe space and kind of an engaging, um, outside of the box approach. So I definitely encourage you to check it out when you have time. Um, the last piece that I really just wanted to highlight for everyone um, are um, the, a number of resources that we have here in Colorado. And I know you've heard from a few folks already on this 
um, kind of learning series. So I'll try not to um, spend too much time on things you probably have already heard of, especially regarding the crisis system. Um, some kind of tangible um, suggestions and kind of tips, um, knowing that you know, there are people in our communities that are experiencing thoughts of suicide. It might be um, someone in your family, um, that there are um, additional trainings that you can take to really build out your um, skills and resources to navigate those conversations. Um, but just some quick tips um, that if the topic does come up, really being someone who can listen, um, not offer any judgment and really um, listen to what has brought someone to that point where they're having thoughts of suicide, what's going on in their life, what's happened, um, and offering that um, support and potential connection to um, some of the resources that are available, both in the kind of traditional mental health realm as well as just other supportive resources. It doesn't have to be um, through mental health um, therapy, things like that. Um, as I mentioned, there's additional trainings that you can take. Um, some range from 60 minutes to two full days. Um, Lucille's going to talk a little bit about um, mental health first aid, so I won't spend any time on that because um, I know she's going to provide a really great overview of that. Um, in your agencies um, that you work with, having a um, protocol or kind of a flow sheet on who you can rely on, what those referral resources are, um, to get someone care if they need it is really important to know before the issue comes up. And so figuring out what's that protocol, what do we use, how do we navigate this. Um, there's tools and resources to help build that out if you need it um, or if your organization needs it. Um, and there's always the, the crisis line available, um, both in the middle of a crisis and if you have questions on what might exist in your community or um, if a situation is maybe more appropriate for mobile crisis response versus um, something else, um, they can help talk through that. So some of the resources, and I couldn't list them out because um, I was just taking too much of a slide and it was getting a little bit messy, um, but you can always reach out to our office. We don't offer direct services, so to speak, but we can, can get you connected with some um, as I mentioned, there's toolkits available. We have hard copy resources in case it's helpful to have a tangible um, kind of firearm safety tool guide or uh, any of the man therapy posters or coasters or whatever that is to kind of have that visual reminder. Um, we can get you connected with some training opportunities here in Colorado. Um, Certainly in the near future, we're looking at how to make sure that those are available virtually um, rather than previously how we would have them in person. Um, we have a monthly newsletter where we try to um, get resources and information, funding opportunities out the door um, to folks that can, can use those. Um, as I mentioned, we have a state commission. And so if, if you really want to get involved, that's an opportunity. We have a number of work groups um, that are moving forward and making recommendations that um, go to the governor's office, they go to the uh, legislature, um, and we've been able to pull down resources and funding to make those happen. Um, we can also get you connected um, in your local community. There's a number of suicide prevention coalitions that exist across the state. There's also a statewide coalition. So there's a number of ways to get connected, get resources, um, if you'd like to learn more or have a need there. Um, I know you already had a whole session um, from Camille at the Office of Behavioral Health. So you already know about what's available through the Colorado crisis system. So just again, highlighting that that is a resource for you, um, available by phone, mobile crisis response, text, chat, you name it. Um, and I'll send out the, the slide deck just so you have the links, but I really wanted to highlight we have a number of resources here in Colorado. We also have a number of national resources that are available. And chances are, if you're looking for some type of a resource or toolkit or guide or booklet or brochure, we can make that happen. We can get you connected. Um, you and your organizations don't have to reinvent the wheel. 
um, we can help save some time and, and get those to you so that they're in your hands. And I think I made it through without trampling on any time. Um, so I will just end there if there's, I don't know if we have time for questions or if any questions came over, but I also popped up our, our email address and our website, which is also chock full of information and resources there. Awesome, Sarah, thank you so much. We don't have any questions in the chat right now. However, um, Lucille is going to be talking about mental health first aid, which has been a fantastic tool and resource for frontline workers, um, which in, uh, in, I think encompass a lot of our CHWs, PNs on the phone. Um, I was really intrigued because you did talk about additional training uh, that might be out there. So I'm thinking for <clears throat> the folks listening in today, who either supervise or directing navigator or community health worker programs, in addition to the deep dive that we're gonna hear from Lucille, what other training opportunities are there for folks that you might recommend who might not be licensed healthcare professionals or have um, you know, some serious grad work in mental and behavioral health? What else would you recommend for the training? There's so much that's available. Um, so I think the first one, if people are really kind of entering into this space that we would recommend is what's called a gatekeeper training, which is really designed to um, provide kind of what are some warning signs? What are some red flags that might, you know, make you concerned about someone? How do you ask those really difficult questions? And then what? What do you do if the answer is yes? Um, where do you turn? How can you get support for someone or yourself? Um, and those are the ones that really can be 60 minutes, two full days. Mental Health First Aid has a piece in there in their curriculum on it as well. Um, and so really that's kind of the, the first entry point. Um, there's also a number of um, trainings that I would suggest that you don't have to be a clinician. If you're supporting patients, um, it's good to have some skills in your pocket around talking about um, lethal mean safety. So there's a number of free trainings that are available um, in terms of how to have those conversations um, and some specific here for Colorado resources. And then there's some uh, trainings for collaborative safety planning. Um, so if, if I'm struggling with suicide, I want someone to tell me how do I feel better. Um, traditionally or historically, there might have been no suicide contracts where you would tell me, um, sign this, promise that you won't kill yourself when you leave my office. That doesn't help me um, feel better. That does nothing um, for me. And so collaborative safety planning and really engaging in what can I do to feel better? Who can I turn to? What are some resources? And really walking me through that process so that I can have something to feel better. Um, those are all um, available online as well. Um, and so if anyone is interested in learning more or getting any of those trainings, there's a bunch more as well um, that could really rattle off. Um, but there's a number of community organizations that we fund to provide community trainings. And then there's also some online virtual options. And I think in the next week or two, we'll be releasing um, kind of a, a Colorado license so that anyone who wants any of those trainings can get them and can do them virtually since that's the world that we find ourselves in currently. Yes, 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 yes. As we're all talking about uh, presenting and providing information from the comfort of our own homes. So thank you so much, Sarah. I do want to say there is one other question in the chat and I might have Lucille um, share her perspective after her presentation as well. Um, and then, Sarah, uh, one of the question is particularly around addressing cultural aspects of suicide and mental and behavioral health um, around cultural and different populations specific. Um, is there anything you can say, and we can, we can address that again, because um, it might be something to think about, but any, any first um, thoughts that are coming up? Yeah, I think, I think it was a question from Patty, and that's an excellent um, kind of reminder for folks. Um, in our office, our branch has taken, um, I would say, kind of a, a dedicated approach to health equity and really looking at um, how generations long um, systems of oppression have put different populations at disparate risk um, for a number of negative health outcomes. 
Um, it could be depending on where someone lives, um, poverty levels, um, structural racism that is operating both you know, nationally and um, at the local level. And so those are all systems that we find ourselves in and that impact people and put people and groups of people at increased risk for a number of negative health outcomes, including mental health or um, suicide risk or exposure to violence. Um, things like that. Great. And so just quickly following up on that as we think about like what are those structural as well as other um, probably uh, indicators of, of looking at how that impact in any of the training opportunities is there I guess sort of a response or how to think about systems approaches to be able to um, really address those as well? Yeah I would say cross-cutting on kind of any strategy that you're looking at. Um, there are available health equity trainings, just kind of foundational, and then thinking about how strategies um, are implemented at the local level and who's empowered to make decisions and how those decisions are made. Um, one of the big, um, I would say improvements in suicide prevention over the years has been centering voices of lived experience as leaders in suicide prevention. So learning from people who have had thoughts of suicide, who have um, survived an attempt, and who have lost loved ones, really centering those voices across the continuum um, so that we can do better, um, that our prevention can do better and serve people better, um, and really being mindful on some of those um, historical experiences of communities, um, just knowing how that plays um, and increases risk. Right. Uh, across well, thank you so much. Um, I think this is fantastic, and I think it was a wonderful balance of, um, of data and information and resources and really setting the stage, and we'll continue to provide um, updates about the trainings, and we'll have more time for questions and, and thoughts. So uh, thank you so much. And I think it was a nice build off of, um, like you said, the work that Camille and others had shared uh, based on the uh, additional setting the stage. So the, this was awesome. Um, I'm going to go ahead and transition again. So if there are more questions for Sarah, add that in the Q&A. Uh, we will have time for an additional 20 minutes or so after uh, Luc uh, Lucille's presentation um, to have some ad additional questions and dialogue. Uh, so with that, I'm going to um, hand it off to the lovely and talented Lucille Johnson, who um, is a longtime friend and colleague, and has, I, as I noted earlier, has been really also at the front of offering the trainings and being a link through the Navigator Training Collaborative and that link for mental health first aid, which builds off of Sarah's uh, uh, presentation about possible resources. So Lucille, can we turn it over to you to uh, share slides and to to uh, move us along. Absolutely. Fantastic. We'll get it going here. Right, and Lucille's voice and look is made for presentations <laughs> and should have been on television, I'm, I'm, um, I'm convinced. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and shut off my camera. Oh, stop Andy, but thanks. <laughs> So I'm, I'm really delighted to be here with you uh, today to talk about mental health first aid. Um, I will say Andy already gave an introduction for me. I have been working with the PNTC for a while. Prior to that, I was the director of health initiatives at a local um, nonprofit. Um, I love mental health first aid and I'm excited to be able to share with you um, my journey about how I became involved it started in 2010 when I became a member of the Board of Directors for the Mental Health Center of Denver. Through that service, I was introduced to mental health first aid um, because I was very intrigued by the notion of having a program that's similar to CPR that addressed what to do when you encounter someone developing a mental health problem or experiencing a mental health crisis. So I became uh, trained as a mental health first aider, and as soon as that was complete, I knew that I had to become an instructor because there are certain communities I felt that might not be exposed to this information, so I wanted to um, be a part of doing that. 
So a brief history of mental health first aid. It originated in Australia. It was developed in 2001 by Betty Kirch Kitchener and Anthony Jorm. And then in 2008, it was brought to the United States by the National Council for Behavioral Health. And what you'll find today are statewide initiatives across the United States. So now I'm going to toss it to Aaron for a quick minute. We're going to watch a video that gives us a really neat um, overview. One in four people will struggle with a mental health issue in their lifetime. That means you will likely be impacted either directly or indirectly. If you or a loved one was struggling with mental illness, would you know how to recognize the warning signs? Would you know how to find the help that you or your loved one needs? We know the terms mental illness and mental health can be scary. Just think of the first three words that come to mind when you hear mental illness. Chances are that those three words are not the most positive. But it doesn't have to be something that people are afraid to talk about. With Mental Health First Aid, we are breaking down the stigma and starting a real conversation about mental health. So what is Mental Health First Aid? Mental Health First Aid is a national program. Mental Health First Aid Colorado is a statewide initiative driven by a coalition of local and state agencies. The backbone of MHFA Colorado is the network of MHFA instructors who educate communities and often work for community mental health centers and substance use providers. The network is also made up of public health agencies, public safety departments, first responders, schools, and caring individuals like you. These experts Expert trainers work locally on the front lines to build stronger, healthier, and happier communities. Mental Health First Aid, or MHFA, is an eight-hour evidence-based training course that teaches participants to recognize signs and symptoms of mental illness and learn the actions that need to be taken to be a lifeline for someone in need. Think of it this way. If your friend broke their arm, you would take them to see a doctor, right? Well, what would you do if that same friend was suffering from severe depression? Now the answer may not be so clear. MHFA teaches you to support yourself or a loved one by connecting with the right resources. With your help, we want to make this program widespread throughout our beautiful state of Colorado, where tens of thousands of people go without the mental health support that they need. Join us in breaking down the stigma, normalizing the conversation, and connecting people with helpful resources. Take a class, spread the word, sponsor a training in your office or your community, become an instructor. Help us inspire public understanding and engagement in Colorado's mental wellness. Okay. So as we learned in the video, mental health first aid, um, help is offered to a person developing a mental health problem or experiencing some sort of crisis. Like CPR, um, mental health first aid is given until appropriate uh, treatment and support are received or until the crisis is resolved. So what's important to remember here is that mental health first aid is not a substitute for counseling, medical care, peer support, or other professional treatment. During the eight-hour class, uh, participants will learn about risk factors and warning signs of mental health concerns, information on depression, anxiety, trauma, psychosis, and substance use. There's a five-step action plan designed to help someone developing a mental health concern or who may be in crisis. And then there are av available evidence-based professional and peer and self-help resources. Uh, information presented is presented in an interactive environment, and the participants have an opportunity to test out the action plan through scenarios, discussions, and other activities. So the standard adult course is available in English and in Spanish. There's also a youth mental health first aid program, and it is a separate eight-hour course that specifically teaches participants how to help youth ages 12 to 18 who may be developing mental, mental health concerns or in crisis themselves as well. 
So the standard adult version of mental health first aid has been adapted to include audience specific modules. So mental health first aid instructors can earn additional designations that certify them to teach to these target groups. So for higher education, you know, we're focusing on experiences uh, and the needs of college students, um, uh, firefighters and EMS personnel, public safety personnel. Uh, we're also, there's also a module that focuses on veteran service members and their families and includes discussions about military culture and having discussions about disorders like post-traumatic stress disorder. There's also a module that focuses on the unique experiences of the needs of adults over the age 65. And then um, there is a module that focuses on rural communities, um, focusing on building community capacity in rural areas. So they'll have the capacity to identify mental health and substance abuse issues early and uh, for the residents in those rural communities to be able to increase their confidence. So they'll be able to intervene and refer people to the resources that exist in their community. This slide here just really depicts where mental health first aid can be a best help. So we have a continuum between being well, becoming unwell, to unwell and recovering. And the tan part is where we feel like uh, mental health first aid, that's like our sweet spot right there. As you can see, uh, here's an overview of the topics that are covered in an eight hour adult mental health first aid course. It is a lot. Um, it, it does, if it's eight hours, we're talking about eight hours of content. And again, you'll be learning things about basic, like what is mental health first aid, to um, depression and anxiety, understanding psychosis, and formulating a mental health first aid action plan. That's that five-step plan that I alluded to. And then having some time to think about, now that you're trained, how are you going to utilize your mental health first aid training. So I did mention um, the uh, five-step action plan. Uh, this, we refer to it as algae, if you see that coming along the side. This mnemonic is also the name of the mental health first aid mascot, algae the koala, who happens to be auditing the class with me today. Um, so basically, the components of this mnemonic include A, for assess for risk of harm or suicide. So basically, approaching the person to determine if there is a problem, assessing for any crises, and assisting to deal with that crisis. The L stands for listen non-judgmentally. Same thing that Sarah had said earlier. You want to listen to the listening to the person is very important because most people experiencing distressing emotions want an empathetic, empathetic listener first before being offered helpful options or resources. The G stands for give assurance and information. So once a person feels that he or she has been heard, it becomes easier to offer encouragement and information. Our first E is encourage appropriate professional help. People will generally have better recovery if they get the appropriate professional, if they get appropriate professional help. And the final E, encourage self-help and other support strategies. So supportive family, friends, and others who have similar experiences can provide valuable help in a person's recovery. So what's interesting to note here is that this plan is not necessarily executed in others. So if you become trained as a mental health first aider or if you are, you know that situations can be organic and you don't have to go into the situation thinking that you have to start from A and go through E. So it just, things can just kind of unfold. So when we think about who we're reaching with mental health first aid, so this is a slightly outdated snapshot of who we're reaching. 
Currently, there are more than 2,000 first aiders in the United States trained by more than 18,000 instructors. So when we bring this down to the state level, in Colorado, we now have over 77,000 first aiders trained by over 540 instructors. So who we're reaching? This course is appropriate for anyone 18 years or older who wants to learn more about mental illness. The majority of the courses are taught to general communities, which includes uh, participants from across various communities. Now, my specific audience include faith-based, underserved communities, civic and social organizations like sororities and fraternities, and individuals trained through workforce professional development efforts like, <clears throat> excuse me, the Alliance and the Patient Navigator Training Collaborative. One of the things when I first um, got trained and started my career as an instructor, um, it was parallel to me teaching level one patient navigator, care coordination, and some other things. And it just struck me that we really need to be offering this to our uh, patient navigators, care coordinators, community health workers. And I felt that there was extra value added by having them in their own class um, where they have common things that they share in terms of navigation. And I think um, from the feedback we've received, it's, it's gone well so far. We were pretty on point with that. Mental Health First Aid, it has support across a myriad of sectors. So mental health first aiders are teachers, they're first responders, veterans, their neighbors, parents, coworkers, and friends. They are people who are in recovery, and they're also people who are supporting other people. They're first ladies, celebrities, they're politicians. Basically, mental health first aiders are anyone who wants to make their community healthier, happier, and safer for all. So I wanted to highlight briefly a partnership between Lady Gaga's foundation, Born This Way, and the National Council for Behavioral Health. They got together to pilot a teen mental health program a team mental health first aid program in schools across the country that's still uh, going on right now. So if you wanted to find out a little bit more about mental health first aid, you know, as simply as utilizing your favorite search engine and looking up mental health first aid and you'll find a myriad of news stories. I was out doing so the other night and actually ran across this article um, just a couple days ago um, from Fox 31 that highlighted how the University of Colorado's College of Nursing is training frontline providers in mental health first aid. Um, as a way to help their nurses recognize mental health issues and to find resources for patients and themselves. So some of the things that people are saying are illuminated here through these comments. The one that I tend to be drawn to is the one at the bottom where it says, I love the certification program and now I feel more confident in opening the conversation to help others. This has been a leading factor, a leading concern of folks who would come to mental health first aid. They might want to be of service, but they were hesitant before because they just didn't know what to say. Um, in our trainings, we used to call this the no casserole disease, meaning if you broke your leg or had something physical, you had a baby, uh, people will come to see you and they see if they could do housework for you. They bring you a casserole, bring you a gift, whatever. But if people think that there's something mental or emotional going on, they are less likely to do that. And mainly because they're feeling awkward and at a loss for what to do and how to move forward. So 
What we do know is that although mental health first aid is featured on the National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, we also know that mental health first aid works because we hear from people a lot who have used the skills they learn to help a person in need and often a lot quicker than they had ever imagined they would. So, I want to go over a few updates about mental health first aid, and I'll start with the curricula. So for the past year or so, new curricula has been under development, and it's including expanded content on trauma, addiction, and self-care. The youth mental health first aid uh, content updates will include um, information for adults to begin to work with elementary age um, children. In a prior slide, it had indicated that the youth program was from 12 to 18. Now they're switching that so um, folks will be able to work with elementary age students. And also there will be content on the impact of social, social media, which is very significant, and also content that is gender neutral and culturally relevant. So many of you who are involved in curricular development understand that you can't go in and make all these changes whenever you want to. Um, you probably could, but the expense might be cost prohibitive. So now we're doing this undertaking to make sure that all of these people uh, pieces are in place. And to what um, Andy had asked about uh, culturally relevant. Um, mental health first aid across the board has been doing training for its instructors around, they call it cultural considerations. So that is actually a part of the training curriculum for instructors. So when we think about course delivery, of course, we can't think about it without mentioning COVID-19 and how it's actually changed our daily reality. So as such, there was a very important need for mental health first aid to be available virtually. So the National Council is preparing to release a virtual mental health first aid course based on the newly expanded curricula I described. So basically it's going to be a two hour self-paced class followed by a four hour instructor led class using video conferencing technology. So the release date is still to be determined but they're working feverishly. Um, they already had the two hour piece in place, but now we're working on getting the remaining um, hours in place so we can bring everything live, excuse me, online. So these items have been, these modes of delivery have been placed on pause due to COVID-19. There was a blended learning uh, course, so two hours self-paced and then followed by participating in a four hour in-person instructor-led class. That's not going to happen. We don't know when we'll be able to go back to that, as well as the eight-hour in-person instructor-led class. Um, you know, we have to do a lot of thinking, as many of you who are involved in any training about when we do come back, uh, what's going to be beneficial, you know, what's going to be safe. And if we had to limit it to say like 10 people in a class, you know, how cost effective is that? So all of those things are being considered um, as we prepare to new, to uh, move forward and create uh, as they call our new normal. So I want you to stay tuned. Um, again, I'm closely in touch with the folks at the Patient Navigator Training Collaborative. So stay tuned and please visit patientnavigatortraining.org for updated mental health first aid training information. As soon as I know something, I'll be working with the team over there to see we can, when we can get something uh, scheduled for everyone. So... I'm going to toss it back to Andy. Very nice. So thank you so much. Um, sure. And I do think, again, it's awesome. Um, as Sarah set up uh, the perspective and then talking about the resource, and we got to do a great dive into one of the, the resources. Um, uh, so, Lucille, let me ask you, um, I think one of the thinking about also the different types of communities and the like, 
One of the questions that we get often is um, for mental health first aid and people who live in rural communities and being trained um, and then access in that area. Um, and it sounds like there's a ton of trainers um, and a lot of folks that have actually received the training. Is there anything particularly about rural or urban areas? Um, and I, I guess I would ask Sarah as well, mental health first aid, um, is there an option to do in-person as well as virtual? And I think you might've mentioned that before, but for our navigators who are in rural communities who wanna be trained or provide this sort of opportunity for folks, even outside of um, where trainers might exist, what would be your recommendation? Yeah, so just to reach out, um, just to reach out. And so what I like to do is just look at what the situation is and how we can, I like to meet people where they are. So mm -hmm. determining what the needs are so we can meet them where they are. I really, really believe that it's uh, critically important um, if you're going into any type of um, whether it's uh, uh, different cultures or the rural environment, it's just to know your audience and to uh, be willing to go in and understand the culture of where you're going so you'll be able to really meet the needs of the folks when they get there, when you get there, I should say. Right, very good. Um, so I guess um, the other thing that I would um, ask and so you, you noted the COVID-19 resources, they're coming. Um, so that's something that's in development now. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and um, the instructors, I know I've been checking the, uh, the site a couple times a week trying to see if there's any movement. But I do have to acknowledge um, how time intensive it is to trans transition an in-person class to an online format. So I'm offering grace. And so I'm just trying to really, really be patient. So we still don't know, but yeah. Great, that sounds, um, that sounds wonderful. Um, so I guess um, I would ask uh, Sarah too, if you're willing to um, join us in the discussion. Um, you know, Mindy um, Cloudin and then Sarah um, and others had, you know, talked a little bit about uh, the legislation, uh, the resources, and the and like that's available. Um, so I guess right now, Sarah and, and Lucille, um, in terms of funding around these sort of trainings and the interventions like mental health first aid, are there a cost to folks to go through these? Um, what is the support and resources around uh, really doing these sort of trainings for navigators and community health workers? And then for patients, I would also say, are a lot of these resources free or are there out-of-pocket expenses as well? So Sarah, let me start with you and then Lucille um, have you also talk a little bit about mental health first aid and how people can link in. Um, so Sarah, what does that look like? Um, so we have um, a variety of funding streams currently through our office to help support um, the training initiatives as well as some other things. Um, we also have um, a legislative appropriation that we um, contract with Colorado Behavioral Health Care Council um, to pay for mental health first aid trainings around the state. And so um, if folks are interested in bringing a training, no matter where in Colorado you are, um, you know, certainly the virtual option, I think any, any day now, right, we feel it's going to be available. I'm hoping, but, yeah. Um, Colorado has some dedicated resources um, to make sure that if, if folks want that training, they can get that training. Um, for the traditional in-person, we also um, typically have some of those booklets that can be a little bit expensive, around like 20, 20 bucks or so, and, and we send those out to communities when we have them um, on hand. Um, for our other initiatives, um, you know, we have, um, I would say the bulk of our funding right now is through federal grants um, to support the suicide prevention efforts in Colorado. And so I think that will be, um, remain relatively stable for the next few years. Um, I'm also feverishly writing some grant applications this week. They're due on Friday to bring additional resources here to Colorado to support these efforts. Um, and so I think um, from a funding perspective, even though we know that the state budget, you know, might um, be impacted, I think we have a buffer here in Colorado um, for our suicide prevention funding. 
um, to some extent based on this federal grant. Um, so we, we've got resources and we'd love to get them out the door to folks who want them. Good, and that's something that I haven't heard a lot of recently, so that is reassuring. Um, Lucille, anything to add uh, to that, uh, I guess to uh, uh, Sarah's point also about resources? Sure, um, the, the resource that she cited through CDPHE and uh, the Colorado Behavioral Health Care Council, I use that a lot. So um, I go to the website and I'm like, oh, is CDPHE still funding folks to do mental health first aid? And the answer is yes. And uh, there's a list of who the target audiences are because of who I have targeted uh, based on need that I've seen when I've worked in community over the past 20 years. The groups that I reach out to have always been eligible for funding. And so when you have funding, one of the things that I try to do is to really be a good steward with it and to stretch it out as much as I can. So there will be times where I could um, utilize some of the funding for CDPHE, but if I'm doing something with the Mental Health Center of Denver, um, they might compensate me for my time and in exchange, um, uh, and, and in addition, they will also maybe provide the books for the class. So then that way we can keep the cost manageable. I could offer something uh, through the PNTC that would not cost um, the participants what it would normally. So just, I, I think you're only limited uh, by your creativity. I, I think I'm only limited by my creativity. One thing to note about mental health first aid, as an instructor, when you're certified, you, the individual, are certified as an instructor. Some evidence-based programs, when they certify you, they certify your organization. And that's not the case with mental health first aid. So it's even more incumbent upon me, since I am the one uh, being certified, that I'm really looking for ways uh, for funding to cover my time, but really, really being able to reach as many people as possible out in community. Great. Um, and I have a specific question that came in that said, is the virtual mental health first aid being developed nationally or is it specific just to Colorado? No, it's being developed nationally. So um, sometimes people kind of get uh, mixed up about what the uh, national mental health first aid does and what the state local level does. But the National Council for Behavioral Health who brought mental health first aid to the United States is uh, really the owner of or the umbrella for mental health first aid and then all the states uh, have initiatives in, in the various states. So to answer that, it's the national initiative and all of the states will be adopting that uh, once it's uh, developed. Great, thank you. Um, so Sarah, there's something that you said that I really wanted to key in on um, because I do think Mindy and Sarah in our last panel um, had talked a little bit about it is, you know, even with legislation, there is the open invitation for um, people to share personal circumstances to support legislation um, as an individual to come and to really share and be a part of that process. And I think that one of the things that um, even in doing some of that work around policy and advocacy and even educating, um, I think that there's more of that, that we could make that um, connection between people who are serving our communities about sharing their experience for policy and legislation um, and talking a little bit about how to make that a real and accessible process, which um, I think Aaron and myself and others are thinking a little bit about how do we help um, you know, even CHWs and PNs being able to share perspective and how to bring in community to this. Um, but uh, Sarah, the other thing that you had mentioned, and I think even to your idea about we have the resources, let's get them out there. If people are seeing specific types of needs, um, even anecdotally things that they think are happening in their community or really looking at a possible resource that needs to be brought in, it sounds like you and your team are really open to being responsive that, to that throughout the state. And so, Sarah, how, how would people really make that connection to share their interest ideas um, and I guess kind of brainstorm of finding that spot? And I think, Lucille, you talked about that too, is like seeing yourself in that process, being creative, but then reaching out to make that connection. So, Sarah, in terms of the resources you have at CDPG, 
anything particular about how to kind of make that come together for folks? Yeah, I think there's a number of ways that um, I think people can bring power to their stories and get connected and kind of elevate community issues. Mm -hmm. um, so I mentioned kind of getting involved with different types of organizations. So we have um, a legislatively created commission. Um, the governor's also created a task force um, on behavioral health and they regularly receive um, information via the community, family members, parents, young people, whatever it is to make sure that people are reflected in policies, that um, there's equity in all policies that are kind of crafted and, and made and things like that. And there's a number of organizations um, that are kind of primed for advocacy efforts, um, both at the local and state and national level. Um, and so depending on what folks are, are interested in and how they want to share their stories or elevate the issue, um, there might be different places for them to plug in. We have a very strong chapter here in Colorado of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And one of their kind of pillar priorities is advocacy, both at the national and state level. And our Colorado chapter here has gotten awards on their advocacy efforts, making sure that, um, you know, mental health promotion and suicide prevention do not fall off the radar of anyone at the General Assembly, that they know that this is an issue impacting um, Coloradans each and every day. And so there's, there's definitely ways to connect. And if people want to brainstorm ideas, you know, we're um, happy to chat through those um, as well. So. I don't know if that answered your question at all or was more meandering, but. No, I think that, that's great. And I think to <clears throat> also reemphasize that people being involved in sharing that experience and there's opportunities for advocacy, there's opportunities um, to link those resources, which I think you both have um, spoken about. And so Lucille, there's a specific question right there, there that's um, that a, um, a specific note that one of the participants on the line today said mental health first aid She's um, actually certified, um, but to a certain degree that in terms of um, to be certified to teach virtually, there's a cost um, and it's $150. Is that right? And then if there is that fund, is that something that can be otherwise waived through the funding that's available? What can you say about that specifically, Lucille or Sarah? So yes, I do know that there are uh, costs associated with uh, being certified. I would have to do further research and check with some of my resources um, to see whether or not there are scholarships or something like that available. Okay. Yeah, uh, at this at this point, I don't know if that's something that um, perhaps the uh, uh, Colorado Behavior Healthcare um, folks might be willing to look at in terms of a way to help build capacity. I think that'd be a great idea. Um, so I, I have to check into that. I hadn't heard about any scholarships or anything. Good deal. And Sarah, anything else you can add to that either? I was just pulling up our contract with uh, CBHC to see what we have written in. Oh, okay. um, and through that contract, we do fund two kind of instructor trainings. Um, I think they happen at different times throughout the year. Those are designed to be in person. And so right. I'm not sure what the future will hold for that. But definitely um, CBHC or Mental Health Colorado would be kind of the first spot that you'd want to check to because they have funding through other organizations not just ours mm -hmm. um, and there might be some resources to get that 150 covered great okay well it sounds like to reach out so it's amazing when you have one of the panelists on who's like let me just check the contract quickly so yay, yay. We're, yeah we're talking to the right people this is good stuff um so i'm gonna go ahead i think we've covered all the questions in the q and a Erin, um, do we want to do a last call for questions? But um, last time we unmuted people. Um, and so if you have dogs barking or groceries being delivered or loud sounds, I'm just talking about everything that's happened in my house. <laughs> so um, if you have any of those things uh, happening, we might be able to hear that. But there are some people who are joining only via phone. 
Um, so we might just open it up here if we don't get any additional questions in the chat. Um, Aaron, any other input about Q&A that we want to provide or are we open to putting um, our phone folks open and unmuting? What's that look like for us today? Yeah, we can do that. Um, so if you are joined by phone, I'm just going to allow you to talk. You can speak up if you have a question for our lovely panelists. Hi. Do you have a question for us? Maybe. One of these days we are going to unmute and somebody's going to have a question. I know it. <laughs> So 8991, any questions? Nope. All right, I'll put them back on mute for now. Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> um, so I think as we're uh, closing down, we've got some comments that this was awesome. I would also say that this has been quite nice because there's a lot of resources, data, information, as well as um, a really nice interactive program that really talks about the engagement. So thank you guys a million. I think we've had great panels and uh, this one also is another great win and success. So thank you so much. I would just ask Sarah and Lucille, um, are there any additional questions or information you would like back from people or that you would like to ask each other? Don't ask me, I don't have anything particularly <laughs> phenomenal to say, um, but let me just ask if there's final thoughts or questions that you all have um, and we'll wait for any more Q&A and then we will close down for today. So Sarah, let me start with you. I think any questions, um, I think I would just really want to extend my thanks and appreciation to everyone on the call who's doing, you know, really awesome, important work in their communities, making sure that people get connected and are supported no matter what their needs are. And just um, that's absolutely critical work and want to extend my thanks for all of you doing that work. Wonderful. Lucille? Yeah, I just want to say um, thanks for allowing me to be a part of this today. And thanks to Sarah, because like you said, Andy, not every panelist can go to their computer and pull up a grant and figure out what's written in it. And um, that tidbit of information that you shared was just really paramount because I've been through and understand the process of the trainings that CBHC um, held um, and they were they were in person training and understanding that we are likely not going to be having in person trainings for a while. Um, I'm excited because I will pick up the phone and call and uh, ask that question about what about helping to underwrite some of the folks to get their credential um, for um, the new virtual uh, um, delivery, as well as perhaps some of those designations that people might want to um, uh, test for. So thank you. Much appreciated. Great. Awesome. Um, so the other thing I'd just like to make a quick note about um, is in terms of the COVID-19 response, uh, we do know there's resources finite, but have been put out to some of the local communities, um, some of the larger public health uh, areas, regions, or districts, but there might be some additional opportunities in terms of the response. And one of the things that um, Aaron, myself, and others through PNTC have been really talking about and advocating is essentially working um, to ensure community health workers, navigators, promotoras, those working in care coordination are identified um, as potential folks that as we see hopefully some more support and opportunity um, to help support patients on physical, mental, behavioral health, we can identify better training opportunities, um, funding resources, and identifying this collective care force um, really serving in the role. Um, so I would say that we will continue also from the idea of maybe possible, uh, possibility for tracing case investigation, but moreover the resource coordination and how can navigators and CHWs really provide um, this inroad for resource uh, assessment and helping folks through this pandemic um, moving forward. How do we make those linkages? So um, I would just say that we will continue to keep in touch with ideas um, from Lucille as we're thinking about training, as we're thinking about opportunities, those resources. And then I think with Sarah, uh, Mindy, uh, Camille, and many of the other folks about how do we also make this link for 
frontline workers to also be engaged in um, opportunities for training for mental and behavioral health, but also particularly for um, identifying our teams and networks of navigators, community health workers to also um, some of those frontline workers who are being sort of tapped to do this work that we really think of those of you who are already working with your communities in this network. So more to come on that. We are trying to um, connect. I know there's a lot of good coordination, real time uh, response, and we're uh, all advocating for more resources in this area, um, but hopefully more to come on, on that front as well. Um, so Erin, um, anything else before we close out today? Hey everyone, uh, we just ask that you spend one minute to do our really quick evaluation. There's also an uh, opportunity to share any future topics you would like to see. So we really value you, your input and that uh, as soon as you leave the webinar, that survey will pop up for you. So great. And I think to that, um, Julie had uh, said a note that any additional training in this area the gatekeeper uh, that Sarah mentioned, some of the lethal means, um, some of the other uh, components are some, something that people would like some additional training in area and this, these general areas. So we'll definitely take that into consideration. But, um, and again, a million thanks to Sarah and Lucille for your time today. Um, building off of this idea of interventions and using the data and really putting the um, core competencies as well as this sort of programming into play that will be the focus of our next two webinar series. Um, so we will have an opportunity to hear from um, a cardiovascular health program that's really using uh, fundamental behavioral and mental health um, interventions as well, as well as hearing from one of the women who builds um, cancer survivorship programming and talking about mental and behavioral health and how that can be integrated into CHW and PN work. Um, and then we will be hearing from two folks, one from Lamar, Colorado, and then um, from Jeffco area, talking a little bit about forward-facing CHW and PN programs that really are dedicated to mental and behavioral health and thinking about that kind of a construct of program and how people can really think about the integration of that work. Um, so super excited about those two upcoming uh, panels as we move into June. Um, so with that, I think we're ready to close down. Um, thank you again. Um, thank you, everyone, says Julie, and I concur. We really appreciate the time today. So have a good afternoon, all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.